everyone. Um, as <laughs> as mentioned, my name is Sarah Drasner. I'm, I, if, I apologize if I'm coughing a little bit. I um, don't wear glasses, but I'm very nerdy, so I have asthma. Um, <laughs> so um, if I cough a little bit while I'm speaking, that is why. Um, I am a consultant. This is a picture of me and my mom and also my relationship to authority. Um, I'm a consultant and uh, I used to be a manager of UX design and engineering at Trulia or Zillow Group. Um, and now I give talks and I work for com uh, companies all over the place and give workshops um, speaking about things like I'm going to speak about today. Um, so before we get into any details about animation, I think it's important that we start from the beginning. What happens when you visit a website? Every time you look at a picture or any time you look at a website at all, your eye isn't looking directly at anything. Your eye is going to constantly move around in an event called saccade. Um, and the part of the reason why we do this, and these are heat maps of where your eyes are looking, part of the reason we do this is to create a spatial awareness of the site or of the thing that we're looking at. Um, you do this so that you can kind of understand your surroundings biologically, but it works the same way on a website. So why is this important? Like, why are we talking about the way that our eyes look around and see these things? Um, we already use this information all the time. Uh, websites all start to look the same because you get used to like having the CTA on the right and having the big hero image and stuff so people feel comfortable when they come to their site. They know their way around. They don't have to kind of grok all of the information that you're giving them at once. They can kind of already know what they're supposed to be clicking and hitting in order to engage. Um, buttons on a website and CTAs become the most powerful thing. We tend to like make everything else gray or green or blue and then these like bright orange CTAs so that our users know where to click because when they're gathering all of that spatial awareness looking around the site, they can say, oh, aha, like that is the piece that I need right there. Um, this is also why things like growth hacking happen, and people are like, okay, make the button purple. Like, it, make it po po polka dot. Make it pulse. And like, developers are like, no. <laughs> um, so that's why that kind of stuff happens. That's also why we have all these like user testings to see what will work this way or that way when you're scanning and reading things, what actually draws your eye. Um, and because of this, animation kind of gets a bad rap. Because when you're scanning an environment, and something is moving, that is the most powerful thing. You are biologically programmed to notice and take note of something that's in motion. Um, if you do animation well, it can be really, really an informative experience and guide your users in a really important way. But if you do animation poorly, then it can be irritating and jostling for the user. So in light of that, Let's talk about animation in terms of how you can create spatial awarenesses and be responsible for your users. And part of the way that we're going to do that is we're going to separate out two ideas in animation. One of them is invisible animation or UI UX animation, and the other is immersive animation. So we're going to speak about those two things totally differently because they're, they're in essence, totally different ideas. Um, when you're talking about invisible animation, the whole purpose of it is so that the user's not thinking like, oh, I just had an animation happen. What they're thinking is what like a co cohesive experience I just had. Um, when you're doing an immersive animation, the whole point is to guide the user through like an entire idea of animation. And we'll kind of dig into each one of these things in, in a lot of detail. But let's start with invisible animation, what I mean by that. So um, UX animation and UX choreography kind of come together in this format. So when we're creating these mental maps, a lot of times when we're dealing with stuff on a website, the most challenging thing that we have is state, right? That's something that we work a lot with in terms of like moving over to React to manage state, or like understanding state as we manage it in the DOM, or understanding how the things change and shift and move as a user engages with our site. Um, so when your, when your um, users are working with your site and they're totally getting into it and they're having this like flow-based experience because everything is really, really groovy, um, and then all of a sudden you interrupt them with like a modal or something that's kind of just jarring and jostling and doesn't um, work for your experience, it can completely destroy what 
you've built for them. You spent so much time creating these mental maps for them and spatial awareness for them, and then all of a sudden you break it. That's bad. Um, so we're connecting two different states like we are here. So, you know, a very small example of this would be like the one on the left where things kind of just jump into view and the one on the right where you kind of get a sense of where things are coming from and where they're going um, and like where the spatial awareness is there. So um, Kathy Sierra uh, has this awesome book called Badass Making Users Awesome and a, a good talk that's associated with it. And in it, she kind of talks about these cognitive leaks that can develop as we structure our UIs and UXs. So if we're looking at something like this you know, um, burners that you might have on your typical stovetop. You have a bunch of burners and then you have a bunch of controls for the burners. And you can see here, like, it always takes me a second, like, wait, which knob is for which thing? But if you just restructure it a little bit, you can see how those cognitive leaks are reduced. You all of a sudden, just by rearranging those things, ha are giving users much more of a key for how they should be working with your site. So, um, I made this pen to kind of demonstrate this idea. So if I have this map marker and I open it, and then in that, this contact form, become, actually, I should probably turn the brightness up, sorry. <laughs> I was on an airplane. Um, uh, th that contact form becomes the title, and then the email gets out of the way. And then when I hit the submit button, those two things become the loader, which then in turn becomes the success. Uh, well, the things go on in the background, and then I know what what happened and what is where it's going and where it's coming from. Now, when I close that down, it becomes the Mac marker again. And if I said to you later, where did it go? Where is the contact form? You would say, oh, it's in there. There's no in there. <laughs> They're all just divs. They're just absolutely positioned things and stuff. Um, all of that is just like CSS and stuff like that. But really what it does for the user is it gives them a sense of spatial awareness. And what happened was we went through three different screens of cognitive and mental maps that you would have had to create. And instead of making that again and again with like successive modals or successive dialogues, we have it all one fluid experience. It feels much better for the user. So it can happen in these small ways, too. You don't have to do something as big as that either. This is a kind of typical UX pattern, right? We've got like a uh, you know, simple like magnifying icon. And then when I click on it, it becomes the input. And what's nice about this is when I put it away, it not only does it give us that spatial awareness of like, oh, it goes in there and make it feel uniform, it also takes up a lot less space in our interface, right? We don't have the entire giant, like the magnifying glass, the input, the submit button, all of those things. We can actually condense those things down and make a better experience for the user. Another thing that's important is isolation. So if I have like in that same way, if I'm like scanning the, my environment and I'm trying to make create a mental map of a situation, if I have to read a lot of information at once, it takes me a lot of time. It takes me, it, there's more cognitive leaks in that idea. So if I like zoom in on one of these, it all of a sudden becomes much more easy to read and for me to understand and like really, really process that information. It's not a lot more things at all to build that in. So um, I was thinking about this idea of revealing and <laughs> how much I hate modals. I just hate modals. It's like a weird personal vendetta thing, but it's not actually even super personal in that Google hates them too and has started to dock you points if you have timed interstitials on mobile. So if you are one of those companies that waits a few seconds and then springs a modal on you when you look at a site, Google is now going to take off SEO points, so you should not do that. Um, so I'm not the only one who has this vendetta. I, I think that that is a really jarring experience. It breaks your context. You're like involved in something, and without triggering anything, this thing pops up. Um, and I would call that kind of like brute force UX. You know, you're like, I want the user to see this, stick it in their face, um, which is not you know, the most intelligent way of working with the web. Um, so this is me and like a really detailed picture of me, very, very highly um, proficient in drawing. Um, <laughs> modals suck. But then this is also me thinking about it later. 
Um, well, okay, wait, let's be fair. It's maybe not just them, it's their typical UX pattern. I bet that there is a way of investigating a modal that makes it make more sense and makes it not break all of these um, things that you've set up for yourself. So rather than have it be timed and just like an attack, <laughs> um, you would have to open it. You, would have, you as the user would have to engage in order to create it. But it comes from that button. Um, and because it comes from that button, I know where it came from and I know where it's going and it doesn't feel as jarring anymore. Um, sometimes I dismiss modals right away when they pop up even if I need that information. So in this way, I can get it again if I decide that I need it and I know where it's coming from and I know where to retrieve it. <clears throat> so I was thinking about this th these whole idea, like the whole idea of how we have to bake animation into an experience, and that animation can't just be slapped on on top, right? Like some of the examples that I just showed you, particularly like that uh, contact form one, I couldn't have just added animation at the end, and that's the way that a lot of uh, PMs and a lot of companies kind of deal with animation. They're like, okay, let's just build the page and we'll slap the animation on after. But it really needs to be part of the core experience, otherwise for the user, it feels like an extra thing they're waiting for. Um, so I was considering this as I was in Barcelona this summer, and I was on this trip, and I was on this trip exploring a city, and I wanted to build out a day of activities. So this is kind of like a normal use case. I love Lonely Planet, and it has really good content. Um, but if I go here, and then there's like five steps to even get to Barcelona, and then there I can, from there I can scroll down and see the sites. But like, okay, so that's good. I have some content that like helps me find something. I'm gonna pick La Sagrada Familia. I hear that's pretty nice. Um, and I look there and this is the map that they have is like the site and then one thing that's a pub and then one thing that's like another church. But like, what if I wanna get lunch and what if I wanna see another site? You can't expand this map at all or like engage with it. Um, so then I go back and then all of a sudden the sites look different. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I scroll down to food and drink, which also looks totally different. I have to scan and create a new environment. Um, but then at the very bottom of the page, there's this map section. I'm like, okay, that's, maybe that's better. So I have this site, but all it has is sites. So if I, go to, if I click on each one, it takes me to the page of La Sagrada Familia, takes me back. This isn't great. I'd have to keep writing down where I'm going, I need food, all sorts of stuff. So Google Maps kind of does something that's similar but different and it's better, right? So we, once I have La Sagrada Familia, like it won't suggest to me to go to La Sagrada Familia, but once I know I'm gonna go there, I can click here and it says like search nearby, which is pretty great because I can look for restaurants that are nearby that area. That's getting closer, cool. Um, but then, you know, if I want to look for bars or pubs, I lose all the context of all of the restaurants that I was just at. So that's not so good. And I can send it to my phone, but then I'm sending each one off to my phone. So I was kind of, cons oh, and they also have things like reviews, but their content, unlike Lonely Planet, is not so great. So let's consider how animation can really help the user in here. Like, let's empower the user. So I built this demo, which hopefully loads. <laughs> so if you type in La, La Sagrada Familia and you go to sites, then you're going in between the sites and you can kind of go through them and then you can pick one and then you can pick food and you can go th between the food and I could keep going and pick more sites um, or I could just pick the itinerary that I want and send the whole thing to my phone. That's more what I want. That's more what I need as a user. And in this, animation isn't like, hi, I'm animation, look at me go. <laughs> in this, animation is key and core to the experience, but that's not the only thing that's key and core to the experience. You're really thinking about the whole thing from start to finish for the user and not just what features you have, but what they are looking for and what they want to make. Um, so, like, we can just empower them in this way, and that's a really, really awesome thing that we can do. So, a piece of tough love here for everybody who works on the web, because I hear a lot of hate for animation. Do you hate animation? If animation feels like the sugar on top, that might be because you treated it that way. So like if you are one of those companies who said, okay, let's wait until we have the whole thing built and then we're gonna put some animation on on top, 
that is an additive experience. That is not core to the experience that you're giving your users. That's something that you're doing just to delight yourself, which, you know, delight is great, but it's not informative. And animation can be informative, which is some of its power. Um, so things to keep in consideration when you're working with your own company's animation as you're like, l take these lessons and learn from them and want to engage and put them into your site. Style and branding in animation is just as important as style and branding in like text or color and things that we um, kind of consider often for other kinds of things. Like if we hadn't done this with text already, I'd be up here talking about text. If we hadn't done it with color, I'd be talking about color. But I think animation needs a hero. So um, we have these kind of like, if you have, all over your site you have these like linear eases, you can have a confirmation that's like a bounce. And then all of a sudden people on the, your users are like, oh, that was a little bit different. Maybe I need to be paying attention to that. I guess that was a success screen. So you can use animation and like different kinds of entrances and exits to really call meaning. Um, there's also like this thing called React Motion that's really awesome. What it does is it allows you, so there's different kinds of animation. One of them in, um, that, that we're going to go into like more detail about today is going to be about sequential based animation, timed animation that you're probably more familiar with. Um, React Motion is very different. It's like game based animation. It allows you to have physics and mass and put that on the object, and then you send it on its way. So it's interruptible. It's good for things like chat heads and things like that, so that you can like actually have the user engage with it at that moment. So we'll talk a little bit about tools, but the way that these things are moving around is nine-tenths of the law. If they were just scooting over, that wouldn't be the same experience at all. But, I, but because I'm playing around with the way that those easings work, with the way that those springs work, that makes the whole animation experience feel different. And that's part of your branding as well. So if we're looking at these two balls, everybody has to do a bouncy ball demo. Like if you are an animator, like you, you're just like, you sit down and then somebody comes into the room and they say, it's time for the bouncy ball demo. And <laughs> then you have to rate it. So this is my bouncy ball demo. Um, the one, one of these balls feels a little bit more rigid and feels a little bit harder. And the other ball feels a little bit more fluid. And it's subtle, right? It's not like over the top or anything. But these have the exact same timings and the exact same heights, and they don't even feel like it. They feel like they have different timings. They feel like they have different structures. They feel like they're going to different heights because of the way that they're animating. Um, and so that becomes really, really important. Um, oh, one last thing to say about style and branding. If you are the kind of person who has a site like Fidelity Insurance, where you have like a bunch of money and you're dealing with somebody's cash, you might want to be dealing with like more responsible linear eases and like maybe the hard ball is like your ball. Um, but if you're something like MailChimp that has branding that's really playful and engaging and exciting, you might want to step away from that and make something that's a little bit more bouncy and a little bit more fluid. So all of the ways that you work with those, so you'd have have the, the bouncy ball on the right, for sure. So um, with these kind of anticipatory cues, if I have this form here, and I'm, actually, let's open it up in its own page. So if I have this form here, and I write my email, blah, 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 and um, a lot of times what will happen is when you have a form and you submit something into a form, you're giving your information to a website, and that's kind of a you know, not so great experience for the user. You have to let them know that something is going on while you're doing that. Like just having the submit button and then letting them sit there and wait while something happens to, for a database in the background is kind of harrowing for them. So if I hit this contact button and it becomes a loader, it, you know, feels a little bit more fluid. And that actually took some time, but I didn't feel that time passing as well, as much. And I'm not sitting there like, United Airlines, did you take my money or not? I don't know what's happening here. Um, I also like let them know with a big bright green success screen that something good happened here. That's great. You are OK. Why don't you go somewhere else in our site now? So I'm thinking about that whole fluid experience going to another thing. You don't need to make it so big or anything, but just letting them know that something good happened, you want them to feel good things like dopamine when they're on, the, on your site. You want them to feel successful when they're on your site. 
So um, this is part of perceived performance. You might have heard of perceived performance too. Um, this is like a really big strength of animation. So um, anticipa anticipatory cues, these custom loaders, Viget did an experiment and found that when you use like an old timey loader that everybody's seen before, people are not willing to wait as long. If just that, that VGET logo with the tiny little dots, that's not a crazy kind of animation. That's not like a, an insane thing to implement, but people were willing to wait twice as long for that loader because you tell the customer, hey, we care about you. We made something for you. Hold on a minute. And that really actually means a lot to the user with all of these experiments that we're doing. Um, another thing that's kind of nice is if you have these perceived performances that aren't just like out of the box, if you do something that's a little bit more unusual, it captures their attention, and that also doesn't feel as long. That doesn't make you feel like you're waiting forever. And it's, an ama it's amazing how few seconds it takes a user to feel like you've ditched them. So, so even just thinking about a small animation like this, that really doesn't take, like if you're using something like GSAP, which we'll talk about in a second, this is one line of code. That can actually really change the way that your user is feeling about the way that you feel about them. So one of the big takeaways here, spatial awareness is important. <laughs> We're trying not to break spatial awareness because we don't want to let our users down um, and you know, don't drop people. And, and stuff. Um, so, you know, and like when we're creating and using these kind of spatial awareness techniques, we can go from simple, like we were talking about here, to more complex. This was a code drops demo. So if you want to select your seats at this theater, you can see how just with like a little bit of animation, you're actually letting, you're telling the user so much more about what this experience is gonna feel like for them when they're in the theater and how that's going to be for them. And it's a much, much more engaging experience than them just selecting their seats. We can also do something simple and small like these drag and drop in interactions. So if I've got like these kind of things where I've gotta like, hold a piece of information for them. Again, if I asked somebody, where did that go? You would say, it went down there. It, there's no down there. It's absolutely position diff. But like knowing that they know where to get it and they know where it went is really helpful for them. They didn't have to break any kind of spatial awareness for that. So um, we can't really talk about animation without talking about performance. Performance is really important because when things look janky and things like stutter across the screen, even if you have the most beautiful animation in the world, people are going to not feel so great about it. So one thing that's really important is that you're using opacity and transforms wherever possible. You can do crazy amazing stuff with just opacities and transforms. It's amazing what you can accomplish. So uh, I know it sounds like two properties, that doesn't sound like much, but you, you can actually accomplish a ton of things. Um, you should also be thinking about hardware acceleration, things like this Translate Z hack. You can even make a mix-in for it that you can apply or an extend um, the way, where you can apply it all over the code base so you don't have to rewrite it all of the time. Um, so let's take a look at what that would look like. Um, so for this pen, we've got like a hardware accelerated um, div moving across and a control. So this is the, the like margin, I'm moving things with margins for this one, and I'm moving things with transforms for this one. I'm not sure if you can see from that screen, but on my screen, the top one is flickering and kind of moving across in a really janky way, while the bottom one is moving very, very beautifully across. Um, now, also, if you look in Chrome DevTools, and I say something like, all right, let's go to more tools, and we're gonna go to rendering. I'm gonna pull this up, and I'm gonna say paint flashing. Um, when, you do, when you use paint flashing in the Chrome Dev Tools, what's gonna be highlighted in that green is anything that you're moving around where the, it's causing repaints. Um, so you can immediately see anything that's on your screen that you're not really w dealing with correctly. So that's a really nice visual cue if you're doing an audit of a bunch of animations at once, saying, okay, we need help here, and we need help here, and we need help here. 
Um, in case you were wondering if it's just me who thinks this, Netflix also employs all of these things. You can read a case study about that. Um, yeah, they work with opacity and transforms in order to animate some of the very simple hover effects that they have on their movies. Um, so all of that said, we kind of went into all of these, like, how to really subtly deal with you know, your spatial awareness and your users and getting them from here to there. Um, now let's kind of break and talk about something else. Um, and it's similar but different. Um, and it's immersive animation. So immersive animation would be a little bit closer to like if you have a diagram that you're trying to like show something to the user, explain a concept, you're not trying to hide the animation from them. That whole experience is supposed to be an animation. Or like if you think about like the big movie sites where they're like, the whole idea is just like, go watch Life of Pi, and here are d lions and <laughs> tigers and things. Um, so that's an immersive animation. They're not trying to like subtly do anything. They're just like, we're going to wow you. Um, so this is a different type of animation and a different, we deal with it in a different way. The purpose is to call attention. And I, there's lots of different ways of working with them. 3.js and Canvas and there's VR experiences. But today we're going to focus on SVG because I think it's a little bit closer to what we were dealing with before in that the typical you know, web developer will probably be able to work with it and create something really beautiful. And it's got a lot of things going for it. One of them is that it's got really great support. Um, SVG like, has kind of a bad reputation for not being well supported. I do con consulting work with a lot of different companies, and one of the first things they say to me is always like, oh, well, but SVG isn't supported. But look at all that green. I think it kind of crept up on us. We have this like, old idea that it has poor support, but it doesn't anymore. So we should take advantage of that. Um, you probably know these things already, but I'm just going to go over them just really quickly to talk about some of the things I love about SVG. It's crisp on every, any display. For anybody who's had to do like image replacement for retina and things like that, you don't have to slice a million images. The picture element is great, but you still have to make all of these different images and cut them all up and you know make sure that they're all like working properly and your polyfill is working properly. You don't have to do that with SVG. You have one graphic. Um, because of that, there's less HTTP requests to handle, and in some cases, no requ HTTP requests to handle because you can have it inline, and then you, you're not making any requests at all. And the thing that's the fastest request is no request. Um, so it's also easily scalable re for responsive. We're going to talk about that a bit. Um, that's probably one of my favorite parts of this, and that's probably part, part of the reason why it has gotten so much giant popularity lately, um, that's a really, really important one. And it can be a really small file size if you design for performance. If you design for performance is a really important concept here. Not all designs are going to be created equal. You can't just like throw massive things in there. It's built with math which is really awesome. You can do such crazy things with it and very unique things with it. But if you load it up, it's not like a bitmap where you're just like pixel, 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 pixel. You have to pay attention to what you're actually putting in there. Um, it offers a navigable DOM, which is super awesome because it's easy to animate. You already know the DOM. Adding a class to something and then animating it is stuff that you already know. You don't have to learn any new material in order to animate pieces of an SVG. Um, and it's easy to make accessible. How cool is that? You can have a, a creative, crazy, immersive experience with data visualization and lots of information, and it can be accessible to screen readers. That's one of my favorite parts. Like, you, you no longer just have these images with alt tags. You can actually have them looking for bits that you want them to or go over the whole thing if you don't want them to. So, you know, I hear a lot of times people say, like, Flash is dead, but we really miss it. And blah. Well, you know, I, I kind of think SVG animation is more fun than Flash. I, I think, like, people kind of got stuck in the, like, oh, Flash was so good at all this stuff. But there's so many capabilities that we have now with SVG animation that people haven't even tapped into. So what is it good for? It's good for interactive and immersive animations. It's good for narrative. It's good for UI and UX animations, like the ones that you just saw, like that morphing pin. Um, it's great for prototyping because it's easy. Like, the designer gives you a sketch, and that sketch is the web page. <laughs> That's great. Great. Um, and it's really awesome for data visualizations because it's built with math. So if we're looking at this pen in terms of narrative,
there's a lot of, that you can do just with one image and picture and just by moving some text around in terms of communicating a story and in terms of making an engaging experience for the user. Um, actually, Sarah Swedon showed this, <laughs> my demo at a conference, and then she was like, oh, how many introverts are out there? Raise your hand. And like, nobody raised their hand. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <clears throat> what's really, really cool about it, too, is that it can be responsive. So if I'm going to do like a Book of Kells, I don't know if you, any of you have heard of Book of Kells. They're these beautiful illuminated manuscripts. Um, and uh, they did these like initial illustrations. So they take the first letter and they make it kind of beautiful. Um, so I decided to make a modern day Book of Kells. And so this would be like the desktop version. And then this is the tablet version. And then this is the mobile version. So you can see it gets like less and less visually complex and you know kind of adjust to each viewport in that way. So that's the design. When I, when I port it over to like, create the actual SVG, I make a sprite out of it because I'm saying, like, OK, well, um, I, I see some repeated things between the like, desktop and the tablet version. And I can just change the background with a color change, like just a media query. Um, that's pretty easy. Um, I'll slap some classes on some of the repeated elements, and I'll hide and display them with media queries just the way that we're used to. Um, and then I can have this, like, this other piece and I'll use the view box, which is a really awesome tool that SVG has to just hide and display pieces of that sprite as it changes. So then I can have something like this, where it's like an animated effect, and it goes all the way down, and then we have this kind of book of Kells that changes. And what's nice about this is that whole animation and SVG, everything and the text, was 8 kilobytes gzipped. So compare that to using text and image to tell a story, like big photos that everybody's using all over the place that are really huge performance hits for websites. You can make something engaging, informative, interesting, and it can be in, um, performant, and it can be accessible. All of these things, you don't have to compromise anything. I think a lot of times when people see something kind of interesting on the web, they think like, oh, we have to compromise something in order to get there. You don't have to compromise anything. So we'll talk a little bit about GreenSock. Um, I won't be able to go into tons of detail because I don't have tons of time. Um, but I, it's a really good tool for working with SVG animation. Um, one of my favorite reasons for working with GreenSock, and probably the reason why I talk about it so much, is because it's, I don't work for them, by the way, <laughs> um, is because it solves cross-browser inconsistencies. There's a lot of weirdnesses that you'll get in Safari, and especially Safari, and Firefox, and stuff. And this really, really helps solve all of those. Um, IE still doesn't support transforms on SVG. IE, get it together. Seriously. Um, if you, <laughs> you want to go vote for this, they, like definitely do. I should have put a link of, to that in the slides or something. But definitely go vote for support for transforms on SVG. Um, it also offers a timeline, which is super great, because you can stack tweens. You can set them a little before and after one another. You can change their placement in time. You can group them into scenes. You can add relative labels. You can animate your animations. And <laughs> you can make the whole thing faster, move the placement of the whole thing, and nest everything. So uh, I think it is like an incredible tool for animation. And what's really nice about it is you can do it without recalculation. I love CSS, and I did the last pen in CSS. But the issue with it is sometimes these recalculations. Because like, let's say I have two animations that have to fire at the same time. And someone says, OK, make that one a little bit smaller, and I have a bunch of delays after it. I have a bunch of chained effects. I then have to go back and figure out, like, all, redo all of the math for all of those and figure out the, all the delays for both. And it's kind of a pain. But in, uh, with GSAP and JavaScript, it's a lot easier to work with. You're, you're changing one value instead of 10. Um, so anytime you're working with like, a small bit of UI UX animation, I think CSS is great. Anytime you have to chain something or make something more complex and you get beyond three chainings, I really suggest work, working with something like GSAP and JavaScript. So um, we have this pen to kind of demonstrate. I'll actually open this in another window. So I made this, like, this kind of animation. And this one thing fires a few times. And it kind of goes around. And just to show you how the timeline works, I can call a function for that. And then I can call it repeated times on that timeline. 
and then I can have that like first section, and it goes here, and then I can have like that other section, and that's plotted to this point in the timeline. You could see it, so I probably don't need to narrate it for you, but it's kind of fun anyway. Um, <laughs> so you have, and then you have this next section, and it gets it it's put here. So I can actually ju then just change the order of them in one line of code and have the whole thing run in a different direction. Or I could say, OK, it just wasn't fast enough, so I just want to make it a bunch faster. <coughs> and in one line of code, I, that's like totally achievable. So that's really powerful and makes working with animation a lot less tangled and confusing. So the other cool thing about SVG is we can do fully, fully scalable and responsive stuff because you're, what you're doing is you're working within the SVG DOM. So even if you're plotting with transforms, it's working within the SVG DOM structure. So I can make this any size, and it's going to stay totally stable, absolutely stable, which is obviously like really huge boon to responsive development. I can just keep replaying this and making it different sizes. That's pretty cool. Um, but you know our anime, our like interfaces aren't just squishy. They don't just like squish back and forth. But let's in implement a bit of responsive design here. So if we design interactions into responsive animations, we're gonna make a huggy laser panda factory, as um, as was mentioned before. You know, like you have in real life, huggy laser panda factories. Um, <laughs> so we have the desktop version here in the mobile version here, and you can see that there's like different sections to this. So they're kind of like Legos. Here's one, here's another. This one is this one, but it's just flipped around to stack, and then they kind of nest in there. And we have different timelines, and those timelines are scoped exactly to those design pieces like Legos too. So our code is scoped like our design is, and if I have to adjust something, I know exactly where to go in that Illustrator document, and I know exactly where to go in my code. It keeps everything really nice and neat and organized and very simple. So if we have like this and we have the factory, so I click this and he becomes like lasered and he's evil. And then <laughs> we have this and he be like becomes a panda. And then I, we do this and he's like all of a sudden very huggy. And I can scroll my browser window down and it reconfigures and it still works perfectly on mobile. And this all was like 12 kilobytes, Jesus. So that's kind of fun and kind of interesting. And there's a lot of stuff that we can do on the web that we have not done yet that is really engaging and exciting. Um, part of, you know, I mentioned accessibility. Accessibility is a giant thing here. I could have at, like gone through and labeled each one of the things that I was just firing off and t t to tell the story of the panda to people who need a screen reader. I can also say something like role presentation and have it skip over that whole SVG DOM. Um, if you are going to use things like titles, do remember to use things like IDs. Um, this isn't um, just about SVG or anything. That's that's like an important thing for you to note. Um, when you say um, ARIA labeled by title, it's a lot easier for JAWS and NVIDIA to find the title here. Um, and it's also important to have the language on there too so that people in different countries can actually have it be translated. Um, so I'm not going to go into giant details about accessibility again because we don't have time, but there's a resource here with support charts. And this article by Heather is really, really awesome. It was on CSS Tricks. And she goes into like every kind of SVG and how to make all of them accessible. So that's a really great resource. I think she went to the library like every Sunday testing everything on every device. So she put a ton of time and effort into it. So you should definitely use that resource and make good use of it. Um, so I made a game. Um, we're going to play it real quick. So there's this elephant, and he's trying to get tacos, but his friends keep texting him to change plans, even though he just wants tacos. And so you have to like play this game and try not to get hit by the text messages. And there's the margarita. And <laughs> so it's based off of real life events um, <laughs> of this hipster elephant. Um, and all of this uh, was built with SVG and React. And you can kind of see this like heart meter up here is going to change as I get like more and less points and stuff. And yeah, if you lose, you like 
you become hangry and you have to go see a movie that you've already seen before. Um, <laughs> so all of this stuff was created with web, te web, web technologies. It was created with React, it was created with SVG, and it was created with GreenSock. Um, how did we use SVG here? We used it three ways. We did it just directly in line for things that were looping across. We had things like background images for stuff like the tacos that were going to always stay the same size. And we had it in line in React, and I'll show you why we did. Um, here's a heart meter. Even if you're not familiar with React, I'll walk you through. It's not going to be a lot of code here. We have this thing called width in this SVG for this rect, and it's passing down this dot props dot score. And what that, that this dot props dot score is doing is telling it what our score is, and it's going to update that width. So what's cool about SVG, since it's drawn with math, is that when you have something like a rectangle, all you have is a width, a height, an x, and a y value. So if I say something like 250 for the width, it updates and makes the line longer. That makes it really easy to work with and just like update and change. Um, so that's really, really cool. And that's why we can use something like that very, very easily for the web. How do we animate things? We animated them four ways. We did GSAP looping the green sock, GSAP looping functions outside of React for like the clouds and things. We had a request animation frame to see if things hit each other. We had green sock for key, sap, uh, for key press events, and those key press events are just native key press events. Um, and then we had repeating callbacks for the tacos and mar margaritas, you know, your regular repeating taco callback. Um, and we're just having it go again and again. So this is like a GSAP function where when it finishes, it's going to pass those parameters again so that they can move across the screen again. And the code is actually pretty simple to create a fun game. Um, so um, this is smoke with SVG. I think I'm showing you this because I think people tend to think of SVG as only being these like linear kind of like platonic shapes and that you can't do a lot of like really fun and beautiful things with it. But with things like filters and things like gradients, you can create really ethereal and elemental effects. <laughs> Chris, Chris here in the audience uh, invented SVG, so he's making faces at me right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> little, little hearts. Um, <laughs> um, you can also make things like candles. You can make things morph and change. You can make all sorts of beautiful effects that actually look earthly with something that is built in math, and I think that is just super cool. So. I'm showing you all of that to let you know that the web has so much potential, and we've only hit the tip, tip of the iceberg. There's so many things that we can do without sacrificing performance, without sacrificing engagement, without sa sacrificing accessibility, in fact, making accessibility better. So even old technologies, by recombining them and by thinking about them in a different way and by thinking about our users, we can actually make the web be performant and beautiful. Um, I do these web animation workshops with Val Head. Um, we, you know, go around and teach people workshops. So if you want us to come near you, you can. Uh, there's like a, a, a thing on our site where you can let us know. Um, I think we're going to go to San Francisco next year and also Europe and stuff. So check that out. And I'm also writing an SVG animation book. This is not the cover of that book. This was my friend trolling me. I don't have the man blob animal. I. That's not even my last name. Um, <laughs> I do have a fancy chicken, though. Um, this, the early release for this book is coming out in a few weeks, I think. Um, so chapters one through six, and then the rest will come out sometime in March, I believe. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of keep going with these early releases. Um, thank you for having me.